time is tight, so I want to move straight on. Next item of business is a debate on motion 12891, in the name of Angela Constance on World Refugee Day, supporting people to settle in Scotland. Can I ask members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons down? I call on Angela Constance to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, 30, 13 minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, yesterday was World Refugee Day, a day when people around the world gather to acknowledge and pay tribute to all those who have been forced to flee their homes. It is a, an opportunity for all of us to remember the plight of refugees and people seeking asylum and to show them our solidarity, our support and our understanding. And yesterday I had the great pleasure of hosting a roundtable discussion to mark the first meeting of the New Scots Leadership Board along with Councillor Elena Whittam, eh, Zabir eh, Zazai of the Scottish Refugee Council and Professor eh, Alison Phipps of Glasgow University. And we heard from people across Scotland who have welcomed and supported refugees over many years. Some of them came to Scotland as refugees themselves and were able to offer the, the lived experience that is so vital for our learning of the best ways we can support people. All of them have worked tirelessly uh, to help people to settle uh, into a new country. And at the round table yesterday, there was a, a real commitment and a real compassion coupled equally with an honest reflection on what has worked well and what uh, could be done better. There is absolutely uh, no quarter uh, given to complacency uh, as we consider uh, how we work together with our partners and how we collectively can do more. The Leadership Board is a, a new innovation of the second New Scots Refugee Integration Strategy which I was delighted to launch in January. The strategy uh, continues Scotland's groundbreaking approach to integration and is the, the product of partnership working between the Scottish Government, COSLA and the Scottish Refugee Council and many other organisations across the public and third sectors as well as communities and individuals. A year ago, I launched an engagement process to inform the development of the second New Scots strategy our aim was to ensure that the new strategy kept refugees and people seeking asylum at its very heart. And we sought the help of community groups and other organisations across Scotland to hold engagement events. And we asked them to talk about what is important in helping people to settle into their new communities and to provide feedback to inform the strategy. The response to the New Scots engagement exceeded all of our expectations. Over three months last summer, more than 2,000 people took part in over 90 engagement events. And this included over 700 refugees and people seeking asylum. And I would like to thank everyone who gave of their time and their talents to organise and participate in events and to contribute their ideas and their experience. The engagement feedback was absolutely crucial to ensuring that New Scots reflects lived experience. I am pleased that we will be publishing an in-depth analysis of the engagement feedback. This report provides a, a rich source of evidence both for those working to implement the New Scots strategy and also anyone else with an interest in integration. And one of the responses quoted uh, in the New Scots uh, engagement document is and it comes directly uh, from someone with lived experience who says, we don't simply seek food and shelter, but a full life and a proper identity beyond the label of asylum seeker or refugee. The report in particular highlights the importance of language and how fundamental it is for communication and understanding. Uh, and this is why uh, language is a new theme for the, the second New Scots strategy. Over many years, refugees have made their homes in Scotland through two world wars, from Bosnia and Kosovo in the 1990s, and more recently from the Democratic Republic of Congo and Syria, uh, to name but just a few. And like anyone else coming to Scotland, they have brought their skills, their expertise and their cultures and they have shared them with us and we are all the richer for it. We believe that integration begins from day one of arrival 
Uh, for many refugees, employment is a crucial part of the process of settling into a new country. But refugees often face barriers in accessing employment, especially employment that matches their skills. And I am delighted to be working with the, the Bridges programmes uh, and other partners on the Refugee Doctors Project, supporting people who were qualified doctors in their countries of origins to achieve the necessary registration to progress to working in the NHS in Scotland. And I am equally pleased that we have been able to expand the project this year to include dentists as well. And there's a real appetite amongst New Scots partners to really engage more with the world of work and the economic players so that we can work uh, collectively uh, to ensure uh, more real and lasting uh, opportunities for people who come uh, to make a new life in Scotland. And getting to know people and building social connections are an important part also in settling into a new country. Initiatives like the Cup of Tea with a Refugee campaign, led by the Scottish Refugee Council, give people the chance to get together, share their experiences and build friendships. And yesterday I had the pleasure of attending a Cup of Tea event with young people who had been supported by the Scottish Guardianship Service. And I was delighted to hear from young people about their lives, about their experiences and their hopes and aspirations and very much looking to the future. And some of the young people uh, even shared with me their favourite Scots words, uh, phrases, uh, I'm not quite sure I'm allowed, if I'm allowed to say bahuki in the chamber, presiding officer, but there I have. Um, and I've never really thought of phrases such as going for the messages or all right, pal, um, as particularly Scottish uh, or Glaswegian. So learning is always a, a two-way process. And I'm really looking forward uh, to meeting some of these incredible young people again uh, at a really great event that's planned for Rothsey uh, this Saturday. Because young people are also... Yes? Jamie Dean, I hope it's not for an explanation of the word, but you do know. <laughs> <laughs> we all know it, I think. Mr not Green. I thank the Cabinet Secretaries, and uh, can I uh, warmly welcome uh, many of those excellent projects that she talks about. I wondered if she could specifically mention what... Uh, language, English language training has been provided or is available to people in a more formal setting that will help them uh, make that move to, to new careers. Yeah, Cabinet absolutely. Secretary. Um, Scotland has an a ESOL uh, strategy that goes as far as 2020. Um, in terms of uh, the most recent financial year, £1.4 million has been uh, invested in community planning partnerships. Uh, moving forward, uh, that resource uh, has been placed within the, the college sector um, to ensure, I suppose, a, a greater stability, uh, also to enhance um, opportunities uh, in terms of uh, the recognition uh, of qualifications as well. Uh, we've also, for by that, um, you know, funded uh, some really interesting uh, pilots uh, that's about looking at peer learning, not to replace uh, uh, English uh, lessons within a more formalised uh, education uh, sector, but uh, recognising that in terms of reaching into communities, uh, that often more community-based uh, or peer-led uh, English language opportunities are also very important uh, to, to offer as well. As I was saying, uh, Poseidon Officer, young people uh, are at the very heart of the Refugee Festival Scotland this year, which is highly appropriate during this year of young people. But Refugee Festival, uh, of course, is also a festival for everyone. And it showcases the vibrancy, uh, creativity and passion of refugees living in Scotland and gives people a platform to speak, uh, perform uh, and share their talents. And the celebrations are great fun, but many of these events also challenge us to think about the experiences of refugees. Uh, above all, it is a, a festival uh, that provides a chance for people to get to know each other better and, crucially, uh, to break down barriers. However, I know that many people, particularly those uh, in the asylum process, uh, continue to face big challenges. Uh, poverty and destitution are far too prevalent and are a barrier to integration. And last year, the Equalities and Human Rights Committee brought a much needed focus uh, to the issues of destitution, asylum and insecure immigration in Scotland. Certainly. Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful uh, that the Minister has moved on to the issue of people still in the asylum system. Uh, it matters just as much as, as integration for refugees. I know the Scottish Government has offered support to my constituent, Lucan Gain, 
who was very recently, in recent days, subject to detention and the threat of deportation. Would the minister join me in congratulating the many, many campaigners who've worked hard to ensure uh, that hopefully later today they'll be able to welcome him back to Glasgow? And will the minister continue to offer support to people in that kind of situation? Cabinet Secretary. Signing officer, I will indeed uh, offer uh, Mr Harvey and his constituent and all uh, the campaigners involved my continued support uh, and also congratulations for what has been achieved uh, thus far. It is absolutely imperative that as we uh, move forward that we challenge uh, this notion that uh, we have a two-tier asylum system uh, and it's absolutely uh, unacceptable. And the Scottish Government, we are uh, working with partners to uh, develop a strategy with practical actions to try and mitigate uh, some of the very worst aspects of those who are at highest risk. However, it remains the case that we are unable to tackle the root cause of the issue, uh, which is UK asylum and immigration legislation and policies that seem to have destitution uh, built into it. The provision of accommodation and advice services for asylum seekers it also continues to cause me deep concern. I have made the case to Home, Officer, Home Office Ministers eh, for public or third sector provision where profit is not a motive. And I am extremely disappointed that the procurement processes for new contracts eh, have not supported this as an option. We will continue to work to try and ensure that the new contractors, whoever they may be, understand the Scottish context and legislation uh, and deliver uh, services that support people uh, as they rebuild their lives. The success of the Syrian resettlement programme shows what can be achieved when programmes are well coordinated and funded uh, with a focus on integration support. Uh, Scotland has now received 2,300 refugees under the programme and we remain absolutely committed uh, to welcoming people. The Scottish Government will continue to do what it can to take a holistic approach to all refugees and people seeking asylum. However, the tailored support that is part of the resettlement programme is in stark contrast to the complete lack of support provided to people uh, in the asylum system. And hence, I repeat what I said to Mr Harvey uh, earlier, that we have a two-tier system that is utterly, utterly unacceptable. Sign officer, people who have been forced to seek protection in Scotland should feel welcome, they should feel safe and able to participate in our society. As New Scots has shown, there are real opportunities to take positive steps when we coordinate action, informed uh, first and foremost by the experience of refugees and communities. And if I can end by quoting the UN Secretary General, uh, Antonia Guterres, who says, this is not about sharing a burden. It is about sharing a global responsibility based not only on the broad idea of our common humanity, but also on the very specific obligations of international law. The root problems are war and hatred, and are most certainly not people who flee war, hatred and violence. Signing officer, I'm delighted to move the motion in my name. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and I call on Michelle Ballantyne to speak to move Amendment 12891.2. Ms Ballantyne, eight minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to move the amendment in my name. I'm pleased to open this debate for the Scottish Conservatives in support of World Refuge Refugee Day, uh, and I'd like to welcome and echo much of what the, the Cabinet Secretary has said to, in her opening remarks. Every minute of every day... 20 people leave behind everything to escape war, persecution or terror. And by the time we finish this debate, 2,400 people will have fled their homes. I want to take this opportunity for my part to thank some of our armed forces for the humanitarian role they play in rescuing and protecting refugees, and in particular at the moment the Royal Navy and Royal Marines, who continue to patrol the Mediterranean, rescuing migrants and refugees while targeting the human traffickers that profit from their misery. For refugees, leaving home is not a choice. Many have to leave behind everything but what they can carry, and sometimes they are running without even the chance to say goodbye to the people they love. World Refugee Day honours the strength and courage of refugees and encourages public awareness and support. On their journeys to find safety, they will endure cold, hunger, trauma, despair, disease, violence and loss. 
the only thing they often carry with them is hope. The hope that they will find peace and safety once more. But with that hope also comes great sadness, a reminder that they have now left their homes and many will never return. It is our role to provide that hope. As a national government, local authority or small community, it is our duty to offer the hand of friendship to those who have lost their homes and possibly their families. Indeed, presiding officer, family plays such a major role in all of this. Material things can be replaced, while the people we love are essential to our well-being and we should do everything we can to ensure that families stay together. Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much. And it's on the point of family. Can I ask uh, uh, Michelle Ballantyne, presiding officer, if her party would be um, supporting Angus McNeil MP's Refugees Family Reunion Bill, which would bring back together those families, usually unaccompanied children, bring them back together to be with their parents. Would her party be supporting that? Michelle Ballantyne. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't actually seen the wording of it yet, but we certainly will we'll look at it very carefully. Uh, and that leads me into very nicely to saying that I am really pleased to hear that the UK government is continuing its mandate resettlement scheme post-Brexit. Under this project, children recognised as refugees by the UNHCR can join close family members in the UK. The UK government is a strong supporter of this principle, with over 24,000 family reunion visas issued in the last five years, as well as granting asylum or some other form of leave to over 9,000 children in the past year alone. Um, I'd rather not at the moment, because I'm going to run out of time otherwise. Earlier this year, the UK's Vulnerable Person Resettlement Scheme reached the halfway point in its commitment to settle 20,000 people, including 3,000 children by 2020, with 10,538 refugees already settled in the UK. But as, as the Cabinet Secretary indicated, arriving in an unfamiliar country, not speaking the language, with no belongings and potentially traumatised from your experiences, is not the end of journey for families. Integrating into a new society is challenging, and we show our humanity and care by recognising that challenge and ensuring that the support for every step of the journey until families have found their feet in our communities. I am delighted, therefore, on Monday that the Home Office did award the promised £1 million fund to the Civil Society Organisation Reset to provide training and support to help communities across the UK who want to welcome refugees through the Community Sponsorship Resettlement Initiative. Deputy President, Presiding Officer, I am proud of the role that the United Kingdom is playing here. Contributions are being made at all levels of society, whether it is the work of the UK government, the very welcome New Scots strategy to help it integrate refugees, or the acts of individual communities. Right now in Gala Shields in the Scottish borders, an event called Reach Out 2018 is taking place. And that's where I would have been if I'd been playing hooky today. The event organised by TD1 Youth Hub, the Scottish Refugee Council and Volunteer Centre Borders is showcasing the fabulous work that has been taking place to bring young people together. The project led by TD1 Youth Hub in Galashiels started in September 2017 and has grown its success through the confidence building and skills the young people have gained from each other on a weekly basis. The group brings together both Syrian and local Gala Shields young people who regularly attend the TD1 activities and share experiences and learn together. For many, what started as volunteering support for refugee families has now become real, deep friendships. The Scottish Borders has welcomed five Syrian refugee families to the area, all of whom are making considerable efforts to integrate into their new communities, overcoming cultural and language barriers. And support for them has been truly multi-partnership, involving council services, local schools, health services, partner agencies, registered social landlords, Borders College, the Department of Work and Pensions and Job Centre, Skills Development Scotland, the police, the fire and rescue services, voluntary bodies and local communities and volunteers. But I'd like to single out... Yeah? What's the I'm very grateful for Michelle Ballantyne taking the intervention. At the start of her speech, she mentioned that by the end of this debate, there will be 2,400 more uh, refugees in the world. As she's coming to the end of her contribution, I wonder if she could reflect on the fact that that's roughly the same number as the number of children that the UK government abandoned when it ended its, ended its commitment to the Dub scheme early. Michelle Ballantyne. Yes, and I hear your point, but the point here is if we're bringing people here, we have to be able to support them effectively and make sure that this is a journey, 
not an end. And most people who are made refugees don't want to leave their countries and their homes. And we also have to work very hard abroad to make sure they can return to their homes. But I want to get back to the point that I want to mention two people in particular who I know have done a huge amount of work on this. And I'd like to mention Hamid and Abdul. Their contributions to the Borders Volunteer Centre and the work with refugees have been immense. And they have been tremendous in the resettlement pro process. And I know many feel that without them, the whole system would struggle. Their work has not only improved the lives of refugees coming to the borders, but it has also served to enrich the lives of those who've been involved in the process. And in doing so, has prepared them to take up to 10 refugee families, who I know when they arrive will be immensely heartened seeing how the families who've gone before them have integrated and found lives and settled. And hopefully it will make their transition much easier. Actions and groups like this all help to reduce the risk of social isolation and allows refugees to connect with people in the communities they are settling in, particularly important for children and young people. So in conclusion, De Deputy Presiding Officer, we must ensure that all those welcomed into communities in Scotland are able to live free from persecution and as valid members of our communities. Our job is to make sure that they have new homes but our job is also make, to make sure that if they want to return to their own homes that in the countries they came from, that we do everything we can to enable that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Monica Lennon to speak to move Amendment 12891.3. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to begin by thanking the Cabinet Secretary for bringing forward this debate to celebrate World Refugee Day. And I'd also like to thank the Scottish Refugee Council and Oxfam Scotland for their briefings for today, but for the tireless work um, they and others do to support people in crisis. And I'd like to acknowledge the work of our local authorities and third sector partners across Scotland for their part in supporting refugee and asylum seekers settle in the community. I'm sure we'll hear lots more about this work throughout the debate from, from members who are taking part. In the Parliament today, we joined millions of people around the world who on World Refugee Day yesterday showed support to people displaced by conflict, violence and persecution. At a time when record numbers of people are being displaced, when we see countless photographs in the media of the horrific conditions asylum seekers endure in their quest for safety, when there is headline after headline about hostile policies from governments across the world, from turning away rescue boats to separating children from their parents. We must come together and say that refugees are welcome here. We must show unity and ensure this message is heard by all displaced people now living in Scotland. Scotland has a strong record of welcoming refugees and asylum seekers to our country. And around 10% of the UK's dispersed asylum population live in Glasgow. And in my region, central Scotland, I'm really proud of the ongoing work to settle Syrian refugees as part of the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme. When I was a, a councillor in Hamilton, I assisted with the settlement activities in the early part of the resettlement scheme. 32 families have been settled in South Lanarkshire between 2015 and 2018, but more must be done. So I was pleased this year to hear the council uh, commit to resettling a further 120 Syrian refugees. There's also been some amazing grassroots community work in Lanarkshire, like the wonderful volunteers behind the group from Wishaw to Calais, who gathered supplies and fundraised to transport these supplies to refugees who were encamped at the so-called jungle camp uh, in France. And there is lots of ongoing positive work in Scotland to show that we are a nation which welcomes refugees. It's important to share these good news stories and celebrate them and ensure that they're known because while there is undoubtedly an abundance of goodwill towards settling refugees, it would be wrong to deny that prejudice and challenge is not still faced by those seeking refuge here and attempting to rebuild their lives. For example, just last month, Syrian refugee Shabazz Ali was left fighting for his life after a suspected racially motivated attack, just two miles from where we stand today. After fleeing violence in Syria, it is shameful and, and disgusting that this should happen in the country he sought refuge in. 
The violent actions of the, the perpetrator were quickly condemned by the community who came together to show their support and raised thousands of pounds for Shabazz to help him rebuild his life during his recovery. The goodwill of our communities is no doubt remarkable, but we cannot rely on goodwill alone. Integration requires proper resourcing for the language courses for refugees who want to learn or improve their English and for the housing and education needs of resettled families. The Scottish Government's contribution via the Equality Fund is welcome, but local authorities are undoubtedly increase, under increasing financial pressure. The funding crisis must be addressed if we are to ensure the vital role of local authorities in supporting community cohesion is fulfilled. And I think COSLA have reflected that in, in their briefing to members today. Earlier this week, I met with Sabir uh, Zazai, who is the Chief Executive of the Scottish Refugee Council and the Cabinet Secretary has already mentioned. And I was also fortunate to get along to Serenity Cafe yesterday as part of the, the cup of tea with a, a refugee celebrations. Uh, and I pay tribute to, to Aberlour for, for their work um, on that as well. Um, I was also asked uh, when I went into come up with a, a favourite Scottish word. And I was trying to think of something positive because there were a few interesting choices. So I went for Bonnie, which I thought kind of captured uh, perhaps the, the mood of the day. But when I went in, I sat down with two young men who were chatting about their, their mobile phones. Just a, a normal conversation you would expect between young people. But it emerged um, that the, the young man... Um, who was um, anxious about his phone. He had been separated from his, his family and his father in Iran and his friend, uh, who is now settled in Glasgow, was translating and realised how important these mobile phones were to, to these two young men. And it's really important that we do hear these personal stories because the scale and the depth of horror and the human cost of persecution faced by those seeking refuge can't really be conveyed by, by numbers and statistics. And whilst on paper, I, you know, we accept a lot of what the Conservative Amendment um, is saying and, and appreciate the, the tone that Michelle Ballantyne has taken, but the, the Conservative Amendment is something that, that we, we can't support today because um, it fails to recognise that, that we have a UK asylum system that is lacking in compassion uh, and humanity. And I'm, I'm reminded of the, um, I'm sure Christina McKelvey will probably speak in the debate, but the Equality and Human Rights Committee's report um, last year, which talked about people, and she's brought, a, Christina McKelvey's brought a copy along with her, but driving people in Scotland um, with insecure immigration status into destitution. And the amendment doesn't reflect that reality. And that's why the Scottish Labour Party isn't able to, to support that. Um, but we, we are um, content to su fully support the government motion today and to uh, support the, the amendment in the name of, of Ross Greer. President Officer, Scotland has a big role to play in offsetting the worst effects of, of these damaging policies, some of which we've heard about. Joining up resources of public and third sectors on devolved competencies, including health, education, legal services and some housing, is an important step forward. Provision of accommodation options and advocacy is, is vital in enabling people to rebuild their lives here. And this is why we've put down our amendment today. Evaluation is important because we need to identify good practice and build on it. For example, in South Lanarkshire, we know some stuff has worked well, but we need to know around the rest of the country. Um, if I just finish, presiding officer, by saying that um, Sabir Zazai, who is a, an Afghan uh, refugee, who is now the chief executive of the Scottish Refugee Council, said the mark of a nation is how it treats the most vulnerable in difficult times. And I agree, and I'd like to celebrate his achievements and the work of everyone working to support refugees and asylum seekers in Thank Scotland. You. Thank I'm you. loath to cut members off, but there is no time in hand. I have to be quite cruel at times. Not that that's my normal modus operandi. And now call on Ro Ross Greer to speak to, and I don't think you moved your amendment, by the way. Did you move it? I moved the amendment Thank in my you. name. And now call on Ross Greer to speak to move amendment 1289.1. Mr Greer, six minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, it's difficult to really comprehend the true scale of the tragedy in being forced from your home to have to flee to another country or even another continent to seek help. The UN Refugee Agency estimates there are over 28 million refugees and asylum seekers across the world today, and an additional 40 million people who are internally displaced. The number of displaced Syrians alone exceeds our total population here in Scotland. 
And for many, the journey to safety itself is too often a deadly one. The Guardian yesterday published the names of 34,361 refugees who have died trying to reach Europe since 1993. And this is only those whose deaths have been reported. We know that many more go unreported. I've stood by the unmarked graves of those whose stories we'll never know, who could not even be buried with the dignity of their own name. And I've spoken to the rescuers who see wreckage and debris scattered across the Mediterranean and know that they were too late for whoever and however many people were lost in tragedies that we weren't even aware of. We're talking about those who've drowned after boats capsized, suffocated during journeys crammed into the hold of vessels not remotely seaworthy with hundreds of other desperate people. Those who've been murdered by racists, criminals and slave traders or have taken their own life after losing hope. It's all too easy even for those here to lose hope in the face of this monumental human misery. But it's our responsibility not to lose hope, but to give it. And as the government motion acknowledges, there are individuals, groups and public bodies across Scotland and across all of the UK who are giving their all to provide that hope. The New Scots strategy rightfully recognises the importance of integration starting from day one. Every effort must be made to ensure that refugees are welcome here and have the opportunities and support to integrate into Scottish society. Yes. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, I'm grateful to remember. Would he agree with me that the best policy is to try to help people to stay in their own country, or if they do have to come, to, the, come, to come at least distance as possible so they're not caught up with smugglers um, and with other people who are seeking to cause them damage? I'm grateful for the intervention. I think many people across the world are used the many millions suffering in Yemen at the moment would love the opportunity to stay in their own home, but because of weapons the UK government sold, the Saudi Arabian government, they don't have the opportunity to do that. But back to the point about integration. The right to vote is an essential component of integration. The ability to choose those who make decisions on your behalf is at the core of who we are as a free democracy. And for as long as someone who's a refugee or a asylum seeker is resident here, that is, this is their home. And the decisions that we take in this place, in Westminster, in our council chambers, affect them just as much, and in many cases even more so than everyone else. If refugees are to be able to integrate fully into Scottish society, if we're to demonstrate that they are truly welcome, then they must have the right to vote. That's what the Green Amendment today proposes, and I sincerely hope that members will support it. And I welcome the Scottish Government's existing commitments, including those made to me in the Chamber just a few weeks ago, that it is their intention to propose in the coming reforms of our electoral system that we do enfranchise all legally resident refugees and asylum seekers as part of broader electoral reform towards residency-based voting. Uh, and I believe Richard Leonard made similar commitments in the Labour Party yesterday, and I appreciate Monica Lennon's uh, note of support today. I'm also glad that the Labour Amendment makes clear the importance of evaluating national and local uh, refugee resettlement and integration programmes. We'll all be aware of brilliant local work going on, which should be shared widely as best practice. And I'm sure that we're all equally well aware of local councils in particular, who could do so much more, who could dramatically improve the support they offer if they were better resourced to do so. But of course, there's only so much that can be done at Scottish or local levels, of course. For the most part, asylum policy remains reserved to Westminster. And under Westminster, British asylum policy has been nothing short of disgraceful. The UK is one of the largest detention centre estates in Europe, with almost half of those detained being asylum seekers facing deportation. We're not short of reports on instances of human rights abuse in UK detention centres. The situation is so bad that detainees have often resorted to hunger strikes to protest against the inhumane conditions that they're held in. The Conservative government even blocked a UN special rapporteur from investigating Yarrowswood Detention Centre, which predominantly houses women, despite substantial allegations of sexual abuse there. So perhaps a Conservative speaker at today's debate might want to explain that decision. And this is not an issue that is simply limited to one detention centre. There have been reports of abuse at detention centres all over the country, including at Dungavel in Scotland. The Westminster Home Affairs Select Committee is currently conducting an inquiry into Brookhouse Detention Centre over reports of racial abuse, bullying, suicide and self-harm, and detainees going on hunger strike. The UK continues to detain children, despite pledging to end this in 2010. The numbers are not as high as they were um, under Tony Blair at their peak, but as we condemn the barbarity of US detention policy, let's not forget that there is little difference in how the UK government operates in practice. And let's not pretend that as a society we can call ourselves civilised while detaining children, while deporting them back to situations where their lives are in danger, or denying them sanctuary in the first place. As a bare minimum, a civilised society is one which never abandons children in need. The Tory amendment today claims that the UK government have committed to take in 900 unaccompanied child refugees currently in mainland Europe. 
I'd be grateful if they could tell me how many have actually been resettled or why we should believe in this new target, because this is the same government that, as I mentioned, committed to taking 3,000 unaccompanied children uh, who are already in Europe under the dub scheme, but then in December 2017 reduced their target to 500 and failed to meet even that. Thousands of children abandoned and lost while the UK could have taken them in. The Conservative Amendment refers to the high standard of welcome provided by the UK Government to refugees. Those who have been or today face being deported back to their death would disagree. The children detained by this government would disagree. The many thousands denied sanctuary in the first place would disagree. I will not pretend there is some cosy consensus in this parliament today when one party here is the very government causing unimaginable suffering to some of the world's most vulnerable people. When the Greens and many others in this parliament say that refugees are welcome here, we mean it. And in our struggle in this country to show refugees and asylum seekers the basic and unalienable dignity that they deserve, we are far from finished. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Now call Alec Cole Hamilton. Mr. Cole Hamilton, six minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful to the government for bringing this uh, motion forward today. And before I address uh, Scotland's response to the refugee crisis uh, in the world, and it is a crisis, there are more people displaced today than any time since World War II. I want to make reference to something that's come up a couple of times in this debate, and that's the situation on the treatment of refugees in the United States. There is an inscription at the base of the Statue of Liberty, which is a poem by Emma Lazarus, which says at one point, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. That spoke those words spoke to the American dream of sanctuary of protection of opportunity it was dreamt in over 6,000 languages in every corner of this planet and saw movement of people from all kinds of situations over, cent over, over the last century to the United States and that dream was also followed by many Scots that dream today I, I think it's fair to say deputy presiding officer has been utterly shattered by Trump's America, with the Muslim ban, with the images of law students filing habeas corpus uh, petitions for immigrants at points of entry, and of, from children, child refugees from Honduras and El Salvador crying in cages. The flame of liberty is guttering in America right now. The golden door that Emma Lazarus described in her poem has been replaced with a prison and a detention center. And to hear right-wing commentators like Anne Coulter refer to these as child actors coached for the cameras, well, if there are devils that walk amongst us, presiding officer, then she is one of them. All told, 68.5 million people are on the move right now, displaced from their countries of origin against their will and for reasons beyond their control. Like I said, it is the highest since World War II. And they are displaced by dint of politics, of persecution, war, poverty, and also climate change. Remember, more and more people are being forced to leave their communities because of the changing weather systems on our planet caused by man. But we need to see the humanity behind those numbers. Each of those numbers is a story and a tragic story at that. And that is why the response of our country is so fundamentally important. And we have some proud tradition, some proud history of responding well to crisis of this kind in the kinder transport in World War II, in our response to Biafra, and in, to some degree in Syria. That, that is, there is some pride and certainly the response of our communities to those situations that we should be justifiably proud of. But we do ourselves a disservice and those refugees a disservice if we are too self-congratulatory about that. Remember, for every 10,000 citizens in Germany and in Sweden, they took in 70 citizen, uh, Syrian refugees. Yet for every 10,000 citizens in Scotland, we took only four. Now, we talk about a hostile environment policy in, in terms of immigration, and that was exemplified in the Windrush scandal. Uh, but we're also dangling false hope for refugees if they think that they're coming to anything less than a hostile environment here as well. And I, I think a number of points have been made about the UK government's reversal of the Dubs commitment to bring in 3,000 refugees. And this is the main reason that we shall also vote against the Conservative amendment tonight. I worked, uh, as many of you know, with Abelar and the, and the guardianship service we've heard something of today, working with unaccompanied asylum seekers uh, who are children and child refugees and victims of trafficking. I saw that hostile environment firsthand in the attitude of the UK Borders Agency, who said, start from a presumption of disbelief and set a very high bar on things like proving your age or proving that you have been a victim of rape or torture in your country of origin. 
in the insidious reality of no recourse to public funds, which is particularly damaging for those women who come to this country with immature, uh, uncertain immigration status, who are married to abusive spouses, who flee that abusive relationship, then find themselves having to raise children without recourse to public funds in this country. It's an absolute outrage. Also, those who are then forced to attend an interview in Croydon without resources to get there, or for children who are victims of trafficking, or seeking asylum. There is no consistency in the application of social work assessment when they get here. But it is in the reaction of the right-wing press that we see so much of UK government policy forged. There are distortions of populism which create a, a, a fear in our community, an othering of refugees. This idea, refugees are not here to steal your job or seduce your daughter. They are fleeing the worst places and circumstances on this planet and they bring with them culture, resilience and skills. If we give them sanctuary, they will pay, repay that 100 fold. Presiding officer, I want to close as I started with an extract from a poem. What they did yesterday afternoon is a poem by Warsan Shire. She is a Brit, but uh, was born in Kenya to Somali parents. And she says at the end of that poem, I come from two countries. One is thirsty, the other is on fire. Both need water. Last night, I held an atlas in my hand and ran my fingers over the whole world. And I asked it, where does it hurt? And it replied, everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Presiding officer, that pain is visible on our TV screens, in our streets and in our communities and at the points of entry to this country all around the British Isles. If compassion is the most important pillar of our human condition, then our response as a country to this crisis will be the measure by which our generation is judged. So I absolutely support the government's motion today. We need to do far more for the refugees we should be looking after. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now move on to the open debate. Speeches of six minutes. Christina McKelvey, followed by Jeremy Balfour. Ms McKelvey, please. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I would normally uh, like to start a debate like this with an outward-looking positive tone. And whilst I'll come to that soon, I simply can't ignore the inhumanity the world has witnessed this week in Trump's America or proposals in Italy to round up the Roma. And that's a quote. Imagine, well, we don't have to imagine, do we? We can see it on our TV screens. Children, toddlers, babies, ripped from their loving arms of their mothers and their parents and forced into a cage. And if you happen to be the youngest, you get put into a tender age shelter. A cage, presiding officer. Let that ring out in this place. The US government, but not the US people who are calling this out. The once great bastions and defenders of liberty were caging children. An inhumane and repugnant policy and one mirrored too closely in the UK government detention centres that I know. A hostile environment that leaves people destitute as evidenced in the, er the Eric Equality and Human Rights report, Hidden Lives and New Be Beginnings. A piece of work we did last year on the committee and we are following it up this year to see if progress is being made. And whilst Theresa May may, may, may roll out the red carpet for this right wing supremacist demagogue who bans Muslims from entry to the US, who derides Mexicans, who mocks those with a disability, who exploits ex executive privilege, who disregards human rights, and who now unashamedly dehumanizes children, young, defenseless children, whose only crime was to seek refuge and shelter. Scotland is forever, I hope will be forever, proudly different from that. And then the message that will ring loud and clear when Mr. Trump makes his unwelcome visit will ring in his ear. Scotland does not agree with you, Mr. Trump. And I would ask our Prime Minister to rescind that invite because I'm sorry I don't want that man walking about in any of the countries of the United Kingdom. Presiding officer, seeking asylum is not a crime. It's absolutely not a crime. And at committee this morning, we heard from the UN who said that around 63 million people are currently displaced either around the world or in their own countries, the highest figure since World War II. That's a startling figure. But see, those people who seek shelter in Scotland, they will be welcomed. Those who cry out for sanctuary in Scotland will be heard. Those who travel across land and sea will be safe in Scotland. We can be your sanctuary. 
And on World Refugee Day, we celebrate the progressive positive steps that unite us in our difference and our diversity. And the second New Scots Refugee Integration Strategy recognises that strength in our differences. It recognises the values of our diversity, that intrinsic colourful bond between human beings that helps us on our way towards equality. I think the culture that refugees brings to Scotland just makes our tartan that little bit brighter. A bit like the Cabinet Secretary's jacket today. The strategy is already working. Two of the principles that, that, which underpin the New Scots strategy are refugee involvement and inclusive communities. And we've seen that in clear display at the event that I attended yesterday at the Serenity Cafe, Cafe the same as my other colleagues in the chamber, hosted by Abba Lure and the Scottish Refugee Council. A cup of tea with a young refugee. Actually, I didn't get a chance for a cup of tea because I was so interested to hear the stories that I missed the tea. But that gave our refugee community that exact sense of belonging and empowerment and the need, what is what they need to settle in Scotland. And even more, I heard firsthand from those young, amazing refugees themselves and how safe and secure they now feel in our country. I asked them what's the best parts and they said health and education, but to feel safe was by, by far the most important aspect of being in Scotland. That's a real testament to our award-winning guardianship service to make someone feel safe. And those young youngsters told me that no longer do they face persecution or threats, that no longer must they flee from danger nor scramble for shelter, that they have been welcomed into a country that stands in solidarity with their plight and pledges to ensure that they become fully active and empowered citizens. These citizens are here, the here and now of Scotland. They aren't foreigners in a strange land, nor are they shirkers or skyvers. They are Scots, as welcome to this country as you and I, presiding officer. A testament to the Scottish Government's progressive welcome and refugees has been our leading role under the Syrian Refugees Resettlement Programme. We've heard a lot about it this afternoon. But thanks to that leadership from the local authorities and Scottish Government, Civic Scotland, churches, charities, and all the organisations, we have ensured that well over 2,000 Syrian refugees have been welcomed to Scotland. To put that into context, Scottish councils have met their goal to resettle 10% of refugees brought to the UK just two years into a five-year programme. So let me be clear that whilst we can congratulate the work the Scottish Government has achieved, we also call on the UK Government to do more. A goal of 20,000 refugees over five years is a shocking dereliction of duty, an abdication of human mora morality and should be immediately revised. I urge them to do that. In Scotland, we can stand on our record. We stand by our principles that refugees are welcome here. We work with them, we educate them, we empower them and most importantly, we learn from them and we listen to them. The Scottish Government, in partnership with our charities, the third sector, local authorities, volunteers and everyone else who values the contribution of refugees, make our society better. Pledges to ensure the safety and security of those who call Scotland home. We want Scotland to achieve that compassionate Scotland. One which does not care where you come from, but where we are going together that matters. Thank you very much. Uh, I call on Jeremy Balford, we're followed by Fulton McGregor. Mr Balford, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, can I... Uh, welcome uh, the debate and the government bringing forward this debate. Um, can I congratulate the Scottish Refugee Council who are organising the 10-day refugee festival uh, across Scotland. Uh, and I do hope that these events highlight some of the good stories uh, that have been told here today and can be told in other places. As other uh, members have already pointed out, we are at a unique place in our world at this moment. There are more refugees in the world now than there has ever been since the Second World War. And sadly, half of our refugees are children who have had individual experiences that most of us could never even imagine. And so when we talk, we can talk about policy, which is important, but out of a minute we need to say what is best for individuals and particularly for children. I think, as the previous speaker mentioned, we can be proud of how we have dealt with the Syrian refugees coming to this country. When the scheme was first announced, I was a local councillor here in Edinburgh, and I saw firsthand 
how it should work at its best. UK, Scottish, local authorities, third sector coming together, putting aside political differences and working together for the best of those that were coming to our country. And I think it has worked well. I look here in, in Edinburgh uh, and see those that came under that scheme integrated into Edinburgh life. Not put in one part of the city, but spread across the city. Schools working with children in those schools so that they could understand what is going on. But the difficulty that Edinburgh faced and Edinburgh continues to face is in regard to the shortage of housing and suitable housing. I have a constituent at the moment that I'm working with who has, um, is a refugee uh, living in a, a, a flat which probably none of us would want to live in with heavy damp. The child has health conditions, but it is proven impossible to find another house for that individual simply because there are so few available in Edinburgh. And I think it was interesting when um, I was on the Equal Opportunities and Human Rights Committee and we did that report last year. And I think one of the questions we do need to come back to as a parliament and as a government is that around, do we keep refugees um, in central Scotland alone or do we do a dispersal that is wider across the whole of Scotland? And it was interesting when we took evidence on that point, there were pl uh, pluses and minuses on both. But I do think if we are going to continue with the policies that the Scottish Government are taking forward and which we support, we do need to look at dispersion. I think we have to look at the uh, support that comes not just when a refugee arrives, but the ongoing support that they will acquire, particularly for those who do not have English as their first language. But the point I, I, I made to Mr Gear, and I do think it is an important point, that yes, refugees don't want to leave their country, and where possible, we should stop the journey at the earliest part. Why? I think my time is about to go. Two minutes, oh, just under two yes, minutes. Absolutely. Ross Greer. I'm very grateful to that point. I'm sure every refugee currently in Scotland would agree that they did not want to have to flee their own home. Would Mr Balfour agree that the UK government, as the world's second largest arms dealer, massively contributes towards the need for people to flee their home? I think, you, I think with respect, you, Jeremy you, made, Balfour, sorry. you made that point already, and I think it is a way oversimplification of that to bring forward that as an argument. So I do support what the UK government is doing through the international development in helping countries like Turkey, uh, Turkey to help people who are refugees there to save them having to come to Germany, France, Britain, other parts of Europe where they are often smuggled, where they are often put in danger and they end up in prostitution. And I do think we need to look at how we do help as many people stay as close... I'm not second. This is a point of information, presiding officer. One in six people in Lebanon uh, is a refugee in Jordan. The figure is one in 14 uh, persons is a refugee in Turkey. It's actually one in 23. So actually, most refugees are currently close to uh, their home countries. But surely, surely Mr Balfour would agree that it's a, a global responsibility that these countries should not be left to cope alone. Absolutely. Mr. Balfour. I mean, that, that is the point I'm trying to, to make to the Cabinet Secretary that it is far better for us to put support into those countries where the people are, rather than them, them having to trek across the whole of Europe with that danger. So I do support more money being given to Jordan and other countries for that, and I think that has to be one of our key priorities uh, going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Kezia Dugdale. Mr McGregor, please. Thank you, President Nossa. I, welcome, I want to start by saying that I welcome the Parliament's recognition of World Refugee Day. World Refugee Day has taken place every day in June, every June for the last 18 years. The first World Refugee Day took place in the aftermath of the Kosovo refugee crisis, and I am saddened to stand here and say that since then, several more global refugee crises 
have occurred. A UN report noted that in 2017, someone was displaced from their home every two seconds. With more than 68 million refugees around the world, they currently outnumber the population of the UK. Recent weeks and days, of course, have seen the tension on the US-Mexican border, and like my colleague Christina McKelvey, I think that it's, it, it's almost impossible to stand up here and talk in this debate and not mention that heartbreaking situation that we all seen on our screens over the last couple of days. You know, involuntary, people involuntarily fleeing their homes due to extraordinary unchecked violence, including murder, rape, abduction, and forced recruitment of children into gangs. These families have been seeking protection in countries throughout that region. And although I welcome the, the President's executive order reversing his administration's policy of separating migrant children from parents after the, 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 the outrage from the, the world community, um, it says the First Minister said today, presiding officer, that we must still be critical of the whole detention system and to think that now children will be detained with their parents rather than being detained separately is not much of a plus. And also, presiding officer had mentioned that the United States removed themselves from the Human Rights Council in the face of such a tense situation. We're all familiar, of course, with the tragic situation in Syria. A UN projection stated that the Syrian crisis has created over 6 million refugees and this conflict has now lasted longer than World War II, as showing few signs of de-escalating. And I'm sure many members here in the chamber will be like me and remember the, um, the, the Don't Bomb Syria campaign a few years ago when the UK government decided to get involved. Every month we hear of boats of refugees sinking in the Mediterranean, killing entire families. The desperation that people must have to escape their homes and endanger their families is unfathomable. When you realise that placing your family in an overcrowded dinghy is a preferable option to remaining, at, uh, remaining in your home, the turmoil that these refugees are fleeing from starts to become a bit clearer and we all must sit and take note. These stories that, place hundreds of, that take place hundreds of miles away and it might be easy to put them into the back of your mind, but this is truly a global issue. Scotland has done much for refugees in recent years and I believe the Parliament needs to recognise the hard work that is going into welcoming these many vulnerable people. For local authorities, the decision to participate in the international humanitarian protection schemes is completely voluntary, and I'm proud to say, as others have, others have already, that every single local authority willingly committed to supporting the scheme. Last December, the 2000 Syrian refugee was successfully resettled in Scotland, three years ahead of target, and since then, 500 more refugees now call Scotland home. Several local authorities are looking after unaccompanied asylum-seeking children who have arrived in Scotland with no parent or carer to support them. As tragic as these situations are, they are made a bit easier by these authorities providing a wide range of services to ensure that these young people have every opportunity to prosper in Scotland. And so far, local authorities have cared for almost 40 unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. I also echo COSA's recommendation that the Scottish Parliament should recognise and applaud the hard work and dedication of local authority staff and their community, community partners in today's debate. And I will do just that and also say proudly that my local authority of North Lanarkshire are among these. In February 2017, I lodged a motion here at the Parliament to recognise the work of Kay Smith with the charity Help Refugees. She successfully fundraised, fundraised in my constituency for 24 refugee camps in northern Greece. The hard work of Kay and the generosity of the people of Coatbridge and further afield ensured that these camps provided food, water, warm clothing and shelter to those who were forced to use them. And also on St Andrew's Day last year, I was delighted to welcome a group of young Syrian refugees to the Parliament. The families had arrived in Scotland in November 2015, so their visit here coincided with the anniversary of them arriving in our country. And as well as local councils, the Scottish Refugee Council, Oxfam, Amnesty and many other charities have been invaluable in helping refugees adjust to life here in Scotland, as well as educating the general population of the issue. And whilst all these achievements are noteworthy and should be commended, there is always more that can be done. We cannot ever grow complacent. Local authorities are unanimously willing to help, but the issue of funding is holding them back. COSLA recently undertook a review of the cost of delivering support to unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. This showed that the UK government is significantly underfunding its humanitarian protection schemes. The funding gap is as high as 100k in some cases. This significant funding gap that councils face is seeking, in seeking to accommodate and support unaccompanied asylum-seeking children needs to be highlighted. And I urge the UK Government to work with the local councils and the Scottish Parliament and others to, on how this issue can be remedied. 
And I must also note that the Home Office need to look at their policy regarding refugees coming to Scotland. As we all know, at present, asylum is a, reversed, a, a reserved issue, whereas areas which are critical for refugees coming here, such as health and education, are not. West Minister's policies are directly affecting the work of our government, of our parliament and the local government, the third sector. These organisations are left to deal with the results of the UK government's draconian immigration and as asylum policies, and this is not acceptable and should be devolved, fully devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Presiding officer, I can see that I'm running out of time. I will end on that point. I believe that these policies, should, these areas of competence should be devolved to Scotland, and about upholding these values that Scotland will continue to be seen as a welcoming, safe place that everyone can call home. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Kezia Dugdale to be followed by Sandra White. Ms Dugdale, please. Thank you, President Officer. If I can start by commending Ross Greer and what I thought was an excellent and, and thought-provoking speech at the start of the debate. And in it, he informed us all that um, every three seconds, um, somebody else becomes a refugee somewhere in the world. So I started to do just a little bit of maths. That means 20 a minute. And it also means that in the two hours in which we'll debate this afternoon, every single refugee that we welcome to Scotland, all 2,500 of them, will have been replaced by somebody else in the world seeking sanctuary in the two hours that we'll be debating in this chamber and then voting at five o'clock. And I mention that really just to provide some context on the immensity of the challenge that we're faced with and the limitations, I guess, to the degree to which we can do something about it here in Scotland. And I think it's important to have that context. I've spent the last week or so watching news bulletins, in particular the bulletins around the ship Aquarius, which has been going back and forth across the Mediterranean, being turned away by countries at their ports. And I can't help but feel that every single country that makes that ship travel a little bit further is complicit in the pain and suffering of the people on board it and I just only wish that it was a ship that could land on Scottish shores because I know that um, our uh, response to that would be very different. Um, in the speech that I, in the time that I've got left, President Officer, I want to talk about the contribution that um, three organisations uh, here in Edinburgh make um, to the plight of refugees who've settled in Scotland and then one that does so much overseas to support refugees. Um, the first one, which I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary is aware of, is The Welcoming, uh, based in Dalry. I've had the great pleasure of visiting them and speaking with many Syrian refugees, mostly young men who've found new homes uh, here in Edinburgh and rely heavily on the services of the Welcoming Association to find new skills uh, and to um, make their life here. The second one would be the guardianship service by Abelair, which we've already heard referenced, but uh, Alex Cohamilton and Fulton McGregor both heard uh, two young women, three young women from the guardianship service at our cross-party group on children and young people around 10, years, uh, 10 days ago, uh, where we had a young people's takeover of that particular cross-party group. And we heard um, passionate, incredible stories of two Syrian young women and one from Albania sharing uh, how important the welcome that they'd received when they'd come to Scotland was and what they're doing now to pay it forward what they're doing to support other refugees uh, in Scotland and the one thing they asked us all to do was to support the refugee festival and for us all to travel to the Isle of Butte uh, later on this month to support the festival's work there. The final person I wanted to mention is a young Syrian boy that I met at Liberton High School uh, last week at the prize giving. He's one of a number of uh, Syrian refugees at the school and he um, received a prize uh, uh, alongside many other pupils that night and I have no doubt it was one of the proudest days of his life and I was hugely impressed by the leadership of the school in terms of just how inclusive uh, they are and how well supported that young man is. The reality, presiding officer, is that we're actually served by refugees in this parliament. Um, Nezra Hasanic, who works in our canteen, um, had to flee Bosnia in the early 90s. She fled for Croatia just as the war was breaking out there. Her hometown, Priador, um, was the first town in Bosnia that forced the Muslims within it to hang white sheets on their doors so that Serbian forces knew who to slaughter or knew who to, to take away. And she's made her life here and her uh, kids go to Scottish schools. Uh, so we should be aware that this is very much a live issue for um, all of us working in this building from day to day. And I look around the chamber and I see many people who've travelled to Bosnia. I can see Gail Ross um, uh, earlier on, James Dornan uh, was in the chamber, and others who've had the privilege of travelling to um, Srebrenica with Rembrandt Srebrenica Scotland. And it made me think of something else that Alex Cole Hamilton said about how we should be careful not to pat ourselves uh, too cleverly on the back about our contribution overseas, because if you study what happened in Bosnia, you'll know that when the refugee camp in Potukari was 
filled up with men, women and children when it reached the 5,000 that it could fit within that one hangar, um, the UN soldiers asked the men to leave and they actually passed the men from that refugee camp into the hands of the Serbian soldiers who then forced them through the hills over Tuzla where they were slaughtered and killed by mortars and gunfire. So, you know, there's a, it's a very complex issue, but um, our, our armed forces aren't always the, the good thing that we think that they are in areas of conflict like this. Talking about uh, Bosnia also allows me to come on to the final part of what I wanted to recognise, which is the contribution of Scottish organisations to ongoing conflicts overseas. And one incredible organisation is no doubt Edinburgh Direct Aid, which has been operating since 1992 and started in Bosnia with Alan and Christine Wilkett. Christine um, famously was shot and killed in Sarajevo on Sniper Alley, and you'd have thought the charity's contribution might have ended there. But for the past 25 years or so, they continue to do incredible work uh, in Bosnia in Kosovo, Sri Lanka, Kashmir, Kenya, Gaza and now most of their work is in Lebanon. In fact, they're currently building schools in Lebanon with money raised here in Scotland. They've built two primary schools already and they're starting their work on a third school uh, in Lebanon but on the Syrian border which will specifically support Syrian children who are desperately in need of an education at the same time as they desperately need a home. If I could end by uh, saying that Edinburgh Direct Aid have a summer campaign, a summer plea, and that is for sanitary products. That's the one thing they're desperately short of and they'll be looking for people to donate as much as they can uh, to be packed into containers which will travel towards the Lebanon um, before Christmas. So I would encourage all colleagues to look at the work of Edinburgh Direct Aid and can continue to support everything that they do to try and make our world a safer, fairer, better place for people in direct conflict. Sandra White, followed by Oliver Mundell. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, I see that some of the Tories have left the room and I didn't want to bring this back. I mean, absolutely no disrespect to Michelle Ballantyne and others, uh, but uh, I really felt I was living in a parallel universe when I, when I heard the speeches. We've got to remember that uh, it's the wars we created wars that we took part in that created refugees and asylum seekers. So, of course, we've got to welcome them here. And they seem to have a very short memory. The present, uh, you know, Prime Minister was one that sent vans round saying, go home. Yeah. They seem to forget that. And, and I really felt as though I was living in a parallel universe. And I, I think they really shouldn't be allowed to get away with it. You've got dawn raids, vans, telling people to go home, and then to have this very sweet Scottish Conservatives, and I feel I had to really say that as well. Something else that I feel I really need to say before I, I do start my speech is, you know, the largest number of refugees, the largest number are Palestinian. The largest number are Palestinian, and yet we haven't been able to welcome anyone here. They're in camps, they've been there since 1948. They're in Gaza, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, in Egypt. I just wanted to put that on the record, presiding officer. I know that basically <clears throat> the motion does not talk about that in certain aspects, but it has to be, to be said. I want to go into perhaps something a wee bit more positive, but first of all, I really am eternally grateful for all the groups and the individuals that do all the work on the ground, uh, supporting refugees and asylum seekers. There's too many to name, they've already been named some of them, but uh, I think we all owe them an enormous uh, debt for the work they do. And I'm also incredibly proud of the approach the Scottish Government <coughs> is taking. Humane, empathising, supportive and welcoming. The second new Scots strategy builds on the work that already has been before, foundation of dignity, respect, and that's at the heart of that. And that's really, really important. We're human beings, we're talking about not people that's just been shipped from one place to another. And the strategy will ensure that Scotland is a safe place uh, for everyone. People are able to live free from persecution and they become valued, very valued members of communities. We've seen it all, lots of us have a constituents that we've helped throughout the, the years. In fact, they've helped us by letting us know about their culture, education, employment, leisure activities. We've all got to work together and I do believe we all do work together. But it does call for strong, resilient communities and here, well, obviously, I represent Glasgow, uh, the Kelvin constituency, and I was involved at the very, very beginning when we took the first influx, 3,000 uh, refugees in. And at first, it wasn't easy, I must admit, 
But you know, by talking to the people, getting local communities involved, this was up in Site Hill, uh, getting the police even involved, see, within a couple of months, everyone was protective of each other. And obviously, I'm reminded of the, the Don Rays and the Glasgow girls, and et cetera, et cetera, which we all, we all know about. But the key to that was working with communities and everyone rallied round, rallied round so much that we all know it's history now that they defended these people against Don raids. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Being able to work together, be able to share the culture, skills and experiences and really build strong relationships, which is absolutely, in fact, um, meeting Amal on Monday with uh, another couple of uh, people who are, are here now have went to university working, an absolute credit to our country and a credit to themselves as well. Now, it's been mentioned here before, and I think uh, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned it, Monica Lenn mentioned uh, basically meeting with the Scottish Refugee Council, the, the new Chief Executive, and I was very proud to meet him and uh, hear his story, and that was at the Scottish Afghan Society's annual Grand Eid party where the Scottish Afghans come together to celebrate Eid after a full month of fasting. Fantastic night. I must admit, I really wanted to join in the dancing, but they were too fast for me, but they were absolutely wonderful. And I had the pleasure of, uh, you know, sitting and, and chatting to the new chief executive of the Scottish Refugee Council, Sabir Zazi. He's also a partner in New Scott Strategy. He was a refugee in 1999 brought to the shores of the UK. He was dispersed to Coventry, now lives in Scotland. He is the chief executive of the Scottish Refugee Council. I think that's fantastic. That in itself shows what can be done and what has been done. And uh, I wish him well uh, in the future role that he has. He certainly has been through the whole gamut of how you go along with the refugee integration, his own personal experience. He's been through the asylum system, which we all know about and his research and campaigning background, which is really grassroots based. What better person? And we're able to bring that person to Scotland to be the chief executive. Now, I think that is absolutely wonderful to do that. And in closing, presiding officer, as I said, I can't thank the people enough, the, the, the various agencies, but all I can say is when we're out there rallying and marching, we always say in Glasgow, and I'm sure it's throughout Scotland as well, Refugees are welcome here. Thank you very much, President Officer. I call Oliver Mundell to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm uh, very pleased today's debate has taken place uh, to mark World uh, Refugee Day. I think a number of the contributions uh, have, have been sobering and remind us all of the very serious challenges uh, we face, not just uh, here in Scotland, not as a United Kingdom, uh, but as global citizens. I think there have been a number of disappointing uh, attempts within that context to try and oversimplify some of the issues. And uh, I, again, I think uh, some, dis not just yet, uh, but perhaps in a second. I also think there have been a number of disappointing attempts to mischaracterise uh, the very good work uh, that the United Kingdom does. And I'd politely say at this point to, to Kezia Dugdale, the UK's uh, efforts abroad, uh, and, and to Ross Greer for that matter, the UK's efforts abroad go far beyond uh, just military. There is a huge amount of humanitarian support that comes from the people of this country, and I'm very proud uh, of our record on that. Yes? Sandra White. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. Kezia Dugdale. Oh, Kezia Dugdale. <laughs> Thank you, President Officer. I pay tribute to the armed forces and I actually pay tribute to much of the work that the UN does in the terms of humanitarian aid. All I was doing in my speech was pointing to one example of humanitarian UN forces getting it very badly wrong in Bosnia. I think you would do them a service if you would acknowledge that as well. Oliver Mundell. Sure, I, I absolutely acknowledge that and some of the things uh, that happened there, as, as, as Kezia Dugdale rightly outlined in her speech, are, are truly appalling, uh, unforgivable uh, and that, you know, there is absolutely nothing uh, that, that, that can, can be said that, that can make up for that. But I think it's wrong uh, to ignore the good work that does take place uh, alongside it as well. And I apologise if, if that's not the point uh, the member was looking to make, but certainly others uh, have sought to suggest uh, that uh, the UK's only international efforts uh, seem to be around uh, 
round the military, and, and that's, not, uh, that's not the case. Um, I, I don't think anyone's denying uh, that uh, there are challenges, uh, but I think we can be proud uh, of, of much of that work. And long may it continue, because never has the need been greater. Uh, the world's population of forcibly displaced people has reached a record high, as we've already heard. Uh, and as Fulton McGregor very poignantly pointed out, the number of displaced people in 2017 was the equivalent of the UK's whole population. Around half of all refugees uh, are children, and as we've heard at several points throughout this debate, many of them are separated from their family. In what seems to be an increasingly complicated and difficult world where famine, war, exploitation and hatred uh, continues to be rife, meeting the needs of the most vulnerable uh, can often seem like an impossible task, but it's all the more vital uh, that we do what we can to assist, uh, both here at home uh, and abroad. And I do recognise there is more we can do. There is always more we can do. And I think that as a parliament uh, tonight at decision time, we will uh, send out uh, that message. But because at the heart of it, we must, as other members have touched upon, not forget uh, our common humanity. And we must never be complacent however proud we are of uh, the good work that's taken place. Uh, yes? Christina McKelvey. Can I thank Oliver Mundell for, uh, for taking the intervention? And he talks about humanity and compassion, and I believe him when he says that, presiding officer. But I wonder if he would join with me in calling for the UK government to stop detention without time limit, because it's time people had a time limit to their detention. Oliver Mundell. Oh, I thank uh, Christina McKelvey for that intervention, and... Uh, I recognise, uh, as I think anyone would, uh, the, the point she's making, and I'm sure uh, that uh, the uh, Home Office will be listening and looking uh, at what's said uh, here today. Uh, I'm, I'm not here to, to speak on behalf uh, of the UK government, uh, but you know, I, I, our, our um, immigration and asylum system is imperfect in places, but we've got to recognise that there are no uh, easy answers, no easy solutions, uh, to, to many of these challenges and that rather than uh, looking to use this debate uh, to, to get into uh, deep-rooted political points, I think it is important uh, that we use it as a chance to celebrate what's happening uh, here in Scotland uh, but also to recognise uh, the courage uh, of refugees, many of whom uh, have uh, gone through uh, appalling experiences and as other members have pointed out um, it's right that we remember that they, they didn't choose to come here. Uh, for many people, uh, it's not a choice at all. Uh, and we must be mindful of the painful experiences people have been through, losing their home, leaving their country behind, and coming to terms with the reality that they're unlikely ever to be able to return home. The strength of our welcome and the quality of support on offer can go a long way, but it can't make everything right. And although it's not the answer in itself, we, we do have to make sure that we continue to play an active role in trying to solve some of the geopolitical issues uh, that, that lead uh, to people being refugees in the first place. I, I wanted to make one brief point, and I recognise I'm very, very uh, much about to run out of time, um, and that is uh, that I think we need to look uh, at Scotland as a whole. Often there's a perception that Scotland's cities uh, are the only place uh, where refugees can be successfully settled. I think we've seen uh, recently that that's not true. Uh, and I would uh, simply say that rural communities are often equally placed, well placed uh, to do so uh, and wish to help. Thank you. Bob Doris, followed by John McAlpin. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Um, on Sunday, I had the delight of being the manager, and I do use the word in its loosest possible term, of a football team in a tournament during a uh, Refugee Scotland Festival at the wonderful facility in Tory Glen, the south side of Glasgow. Now, I put a team uh, full of star talent in. The captain was Alan, Alison Felis, MP, Gavin Newlands, MP, Ronnie Cowan, MP, Stuart McDonald, MP and councillor Alan Casey, all were part of the lineup. I think they'll be sticking to the politics, presiding officer, but they were part of the lineup in, in the tournament. However, the real stars were Abdul Bastani, my constituent in Glasgow, Mary Hill and Springburn, Glasgow Afghan United, and the Scottish Unity Football League, and the many footballers, refugees, and many others who made the event such a success. The men and women involved in this success come from the various corners 
of the globe. They wear their multi-layered identities well, Glaswegians and Scots, but also a strong national identity from their country of origin. They are proud of their culture and their upbringing, and they're proud to be Scots. I am very lucky in my constituency in Glasgow, Mary Hill and Springburn. Glasgow Afghan United, for example, have an annual Burns, Milana, Jalal, Alden, Mohammed, Balki supper, apologies for the pronunciation, which celebrates both Burns and the National uh, Bard of Afghanistan. And it was a wonderful event that I attended, one of many events they hold throughout the year. Or Ronnie Domeni, originally from Cameroon, who runs African Challenge Scotland, based in Springburn, in my constituency, who holds an annual festival running up to a fortnight of events celebrating both Scottish and African cultures. And I haven't even mentioned or started in the renowned, wonderful Maryhill Integration Network. Uh, I have a vast, vast amount of refugees in New Scots in my constituency, making it a wonderful, vibrant place, and I haven't even scratched the surface. And the vast majority of refugees and asylum seekers thirst to be part of that vibrant community, the communities that they now call home. Presiding officer, integration is what happens when you give families the space, the respect, the opportunity, the dignity, and the friendship you would anyone else. Integration happens. It's the default position of the most positive aspects of human nature. Now, I don't want to paint a, a falsely rosy picture. Are all refugees angels? Of course they're not. Are the communities that they seek refuge in completely racism free? Of course they're not. But there's amazing stories out there every day of the week that you just don't get to hear. And that's the point for putting that on the record today. And I think parts of the media, parts of the media have got a lot to answer for in relation to that. You know, uh, false pictures, stereotypes, negative stereotypes of refugees are common occurrence in some parts of the media. Don't want to give them any more publicity than they deserve. We know who we're talking about. Now, I wanted to talk about um, some positive aspects of uh, those who are seeking refuge in, in, in my constituency. And I, I think I just missed Pat, uh, Patrick Harvey's uh, intervention in relation to look uh, a, a, a man who was trafficked to the UK um, from Vietnam, uh, six months forced to work in a legal cannabis farm, spent six months in jail, one and a half years in detention, and then whisked off for deportation after spending, making a home in Glasgow, uh, in my, my constituency. I would pay tribute to Councillor Kim Long, who's been very active in the campaign for Luke to return to Glasgow. And I just saw on, on Facebook earlier there that uh, Luke's uh, bail has been granted uh, and will return to Glasgow very shortly. That's a positive thing that I'd like to put on the record. Uh, but of course, Luke shouldn't have had to go through that process in the first, first place. Um, I, I did just, um, and I hope I can find the notes on this, or I'll have to go to my phone, but um, I, I made a comment at First Minister's questions uh, about my constituent, Georgie Kikava, uh, the other day, the 10-year-old uh, Georgian lad who has been here since he was three years old. Um, his mum passed away in February. They were going through the asylum process and they left an absolute uh, uncertainty. And uh, in mentioning what I'm about to say now, I don't want to oversimplify this for Oliver Mundell. And I would talk about an imperfect asylum system because Reverend Brian Casey, the Church of Scotland Minister in Springburn, who's been leading the campaign to keep Georgie here in, in Scotland, says that, um, and I think it was today, that Georgie was detained for several hours on his own and separated from Catino, his, his, his grand Katie, at Home Office Centre in London. I don't have any more information than that, but people are deeply worried. And that's no way. I, I, I hope there's an explanation to that. Uh, and I hope the explanation is they're going to move quickly to guarantee uh, young uh, Georgie the stability and security he needs to continue his, his life and upbringing in Springburn as his home, along with his grand. But just that thought that he was uh, detained and separated from his gran is no way to run an asylum system. Um, so we're debating uh, World Refugee Day here. I want to put on record the great contribution that I see refugees uh, make to the constituency that I represent. And I'm not actually talking about, and apologies, presiding officer, uh, young, young Somer uh, 
Barkish, who I didn't even know was a refugee. Why would I? I just put a motion down to Parliament congratulating him for winning awards at Springburn Academy. And it was drawn to my attention that him, his brother, his mother and father are, at fa are fear facing deportation to Pakistan, uh, where they will uh, receive religious persecution after six years in Scotland. Why would I know that young man was an asylum seeker? He wasn't. He was just a member of my community. So I see vibrant communities in my constituency where people make Glasgow, Mary Hill and Springburn make Scotland their home. I see when the UK's hostile environment uh, is just that. I see the sharp end of the impacts in my communities, but I celebrate the refugees who make my constituency in Scotland their home. And the last of the open debate contributions is from Joan McAlpine. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to start by uh, apologising to yourself and uh, the other speakers that I had to miss some of the opening uh, speeches. I'd give you advance notice of that because I had a very important meeting supporting a young constituent of mine who was meeting the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Health. Uh, my constituent is, uh, her name is Dami Samuel. Uh, she's 20 years old and she has aspirations to be a midwife, indeed, she had a place to study midwifery when she left school a couple of years ago, but she was unable to take it up because of the actions of the UK Home Office. Dami and her family uh, live in Dumfries, and earlier this year, uh, they featured in a documentary called Breadline Kids, which showed what it was like to be completely and utterly destitute, that is, having no income whatsoever because Dami and her mum, who, who was a nursing assistant um, before her visa was uh, revoked, cannot, cannot work um, as well as they, they cannot study. Um, so they have been entirely dependent uh, on charity um, be, because of the situation they find themselves in because of the home office. Uh, Dami's completely in limbo. And when I was talking to her today, one of the things that really I found very poignant was she said she regularly talks to a friend of hers who she was at school with and who's now in second year at university. And that girl's life is moving on. And Dami's, uh, Dami is uh, stuck waiting, just waiting and waiting to find out what the result of um, her application is. Uh, now this week, Dami was up in Glasgow uh, collecting an award uh, on behalf of the filmmakers uh, at the Refugee Festival Scotland uh, Media Awards, which I think I would like to make a special mention of um, because it shows them um, that there are journalists out there who are doing a great job actually uh, um, exposing uh, the treatment of refugees and migrants. Um, Dami herself um, is not a refugee. But I think the fact that the Refugee Council and the Refugee Festival Scotland asked her to collect the award um, reflects the fact that she is the victim uh, of the same hostile environment uh, that affects refugees. And uh, I just wanted to draw attention to her case because what a, what a terrible waste of talent, what a terrible waste of someone who really wants to make a, a contribution uh, to society here uh, in Scotland. Um, Dami and her family have had fantastic support uh, from the community in Dumfries and Galloway. And uh, I wanted to go on to talk a little bit about how that community has been helping uh, refugees more broadly. Uh, in Dumfries itself, we have an organisation called Massive Outpouring of Love, known affectionately as MOOL. Uh, it's a humanitarian movement that began in September 2015. And the initial idea behind MOOL was to humanise the refugee crisis, so through writing and distributing notes of support and hope. But it soon became much, much bigger than that. Between September 2015 and February 2016, MOOL collected and sorted over 40 tonnes of donations and sent them on to refugees across the globe. The organisation raised money to fund three caravans, one of which was utilised as a dental clinic in the Calais camp, while the remaining two housed vulnerable families. More money went overseas to buy supplies for community kitchens in Calais and paid for volunteers to travel to Calais, Dunkirk and Lesbos. Closer to home, Mill volunteers have been galvanising people to take action by visiting schools, to talk to children and offering training to multi-agency groups. They have been, uh, they've also welcomed a number of refugee families to Dumfries and Galloway uh, where they assign befrienders to offer support and to act as a buffer between the families 
and the bureaucracy that they inevitably face on their arrival. And refugee women and children have also been welcomed uh, from Glasgow um, to help heal in the Scottish countryside. Making the transition from a war-torn country to life in rural Scotland cannot be easy, but the goal is to help that happen as gently as possible. We we'll want people who are displaced to be welcomed everywhere and have consistent access to resources, help and support that they need to feel safe, uh, be healthy and thrive. They're a very, very important force in Dumfries and Galloway, encouraging communities and helping people in need. Uh, and I just want to end by mentioning the fact that Dumfries and Galloway's first refugee and migrant film festival, the Incomers Festival, is taking place this week to mark the 20th anniversary of Refugee Week. The film festival will act as a springboard for conversations about migration, refugees and asylum seekers across the region. It's a fantastic way to celebrate the fact that as Dumfries welcomes more people from across the globe, it becomes all the more diverse, progressive and exciting for it. And I think the way the people in the community have reached out to the Samuel family in their time of need is a fantastic il illustration of that. Thank you very much. We now move to the closing speeches and I call Ross Greer for up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A number of the contributions today have reflected not just on the situation here in Scotland and the UK, but across the rest of Europe, North America as well, and it is important to have that international perspective on what is an international crisis. It's disappointing to look across the world and to see so many Western nations turn their backs on refugees and embrace the politics of the far right. Just this week, as Kezia Dugdale mentioned, a ship carrying over 600 refugees was refused port in Italy. This has come after the far right Liga party have entered government there. That same party referred to earlier today by the First Minister for the threats that they're now making from government office against their already persecuted Roma community. Their leader, now the Interior Secretary of Italy, has just called for, and I quote, mass purification, street by street, quarter by quarter. That is what we're facing. Eventually, the Aquarius was able to dock in Spain, but there are other ships and there will be far more. Italy turning its back to refugees follows a trend seen in other European countries like Hungary and Poland. And the rhetoric may be different, but we should not pretend that the UK is actually that much different. There's been a marked increase in hostile policies and dehumanising language across our continent. The creation of a fortress Europe that has sought to heavily police and militarise our external borders while facilitating free movement within them. In the United States, policies enacted by the Trump administration have gone to further depths of barbarity and callousness, forcibly separating children from their parents at the border, detaining them in camps, constructing, as Christina McKelvey referred to, tender age camps for the detention of babies and toddlers specifically, refusing them the basic dignity which all children in any corner of this earth deserve. Reports have come out of older children being forced to change the nappies of babies they did not know as guards wouldn't enter the cages they're collectively held in. Recordings have surfaced of traumatized toddlers screaming for their parents as guards mock them. These are not care facilities. They're not summer camps as the tin pot fascists on Fox News refer to them as. They're detention camps for children, for babies. And now, in the well-practiced fascist tactic of implementing something so appalling that even the smallest rollback can be seen as a compromise, the US government will no longer separate families. They'll detain them in cages together. What progress. To make matters worse, the former director of US immigration enforcement predicted that many of the children already, already forcibly separated from their families will never be reunited. He stated yesterday, you could be creating thousands of immigrant orphans. From this parliament, we should stand in solidarity with those resisting these actions. Yesterday, I spoke to a friend from my sister church in the US. They mentioned the wonderful work of organizations such as Racies in Texas, who would welcome donations to their family reunification fund, and the work of churches and others literally going out into the desert to give water to those arriving via those dangerous routes. They told me of families being offered sanctuary in church buildings, where in one case, they've been trapped for nine months. If they leave, they'll be arrested, sent to detention camps, and then deported. Many churches have been forced to go underground with the support they're offering after threats from the US government to revoke their status. Over 150 years ago, brave people ran an underground railroad for slaves to escape the southern United States to freedom in the north. And today I'm very proud to say that I know people who are supporting another underground network for refugees arriving at the Mexican border. I've seen the reality of disastrous, cruel and inhumane border policy. Last year I visited Lampedusa, the tiny Italian island, 200 kilometres from the Libyan coast and known as the door to Europe. I want to briefly share some of the stories of those I met there. One young man, 17 years old, told me how hundreds of people were crammed into the hold of a ship. 
When that ship began to sink on one side, there were so many people with so little room to move that those unfortunate enough to be on that side simply drowned. There was nowhere to go. One 16-year-old who was brave enough to share her deeply painful story of being kidnapped in Libya, held as a sex slave, and when I met her, pregnant by rape. And those who we couldn't meet, but whose graves we stood beside, like Walela, an 18-year-old woman from Eritrea, when gas canisters exploded at the warehouse she was being held in by human traffickers, they didn't take her to hospital. They put her on a boat to die in agony in the Mediterranean. It's their stories that I think of, the pain on their faces that I remember when I hear members here congratulating the UK government on its record. Taking aside the points that Sandra White and I made in response to Jeremy Balfour about the UK's role in funding, supplying or directly taking part in conflicts with, which force people to flee. It's the UK government's absolute inability to live up to our moral responsibility and take in those that we can help that I simply can't tolerate. I'm privileged to know Alf Dubbs, the kinder transport survivor who's kept the issue of child refugees on the agenda when the UK government would rather it go away. Christina McKelvey and I were with him last week and when I sat with him, I couldn't help but think of the two and a half thousand unaccompanied child refugees that the UK government committed to taking in before abandoning, never mind the 160,000 more who are scattered across mainland Europe. When I hear the high standards referred to in the Conservative Amendment of the UK asylum policy, I can only think of the cases in just the last fortnight where members of this parliament have had to fight desperately alongside many others to keep members of our communities off of deportation flights. The 10-year-old orphan, uh, Gorgi Kakafka, that Bob Doris referred to, who doesn't speak Georgian, who left Georgia under threats to his family when he was three years old, but who the Home Office are seriously considering deporting. Human trafficking victim, uh, Duke Nugent, who's been detained pending deportation to Vietnam, who's fortunately made bail today, as Patrick Harvey mentioned, but who still faces the threat of deportation. And the Bakish family from Pakistan uh, that Bob Doris again mentioned, whose children are terrified that they'll be murdered because of their faith if they return, but who've now been repeatedly turned down in their asylum claims and yet again face deportation. I'm proud that this parliament will join communities across the country today, standing not just for, but with those whose life is here now after being forced to seek refuge and asylum. I'm proud of those in my own community who this weekend hosted a wonderful dinner on Father's Day for the Syrian families now settled in Eastern Bartonshire with the food kindly provided by the families themselves. I'm proud that as a darkness appears to be once again falling over Europe, across much of Europe and the West, that we will today insist on keeping here a light that they cannot put out. I'm today very proud to say I'm a member of this parliament. Thank you. Call Pauline McNeill up to six minutes, please. 34,361 is the number of people seeking refuge and asylum who've died since 1993. All credit to the Guardian newspaper today uh, who reported that an organisation has seeked for every single name of every single person. Obviously, they weren't able to identify all the names, but these are people. Two years ago, I invited a Syrian family to Christmas dinner. They were part of the refugee programme, Rana, Sami, Faraz and Sarah. They had been in Scotland only a few months and I didn't really know how my own family would react to complete strangers at the dinner table with a halal turkey. But to my surprise, they arrived with presents for the children. And I have to say it was one of the best Christmases that we've had. And we've had a second Christmas with them too. Sarah and Faraz, age eight and nine, were still traumatised by the bombs they heard going off at night as they tried to sleep. And they're scared of my two large dogs, as they're used to seeing dogs eat dead bodies in the streets of Damascus. But we're working on that. They love Scotland. There's no doubt that anyone, I think, who settles here loves Scotland. But they are still very much adjusting to what happened in their own country, because they've left family behind. We live in the darkest of times. Other members have talked about this. Oxfam says that more than 65 million people are forced to flee their homes by deadly conflict and violence. And recent political events across Europe show what a dangerous point that we have reached in dealing with this human tragedy. I agree with Ross Gale Greer wholeheartedly that Scotland and Britain must be a shining example ahead of other European countries to show how refugees should be treated. Jeremy Balfour and Arthur Mandel say there's an oversimplification of the causes of this. Well, there's no doubt that there's a certain element of complexity to war and conflict. But the US-led invasion alone displaced some 4 million people and Iraqis who flee that country and who are still fleeing Iraq because it is one of the most miserable places on earth right now. A decade of murderous sanctions, 
as is a product of the Iraq war, created the disaster in Syria, adding to the internal strife that already existed. The French and British bombing of Libya is still a source of many more refugees. So, there are some complexities, but some of it is quite easy to understand why all of Europe's borders are having refugees coming to them. In fact, half the global refugee population comes from three countries, Syria, Afghanistan and southern Sudan. And Sandra White is quite right to point out that Pal Palestinian refugees are still the largest. I personally was ashamed of the antics of the Tories around the acceptance um, or the denial of the Dubs scheme, which would have allowed 3,000 children to benefit, and instead we had 350. And FOI requests have shown that councils were prepared to take far more. Some excellent speeches this afternoon from Alec Cole-Hammond and Christina McKelva, Kelvy, Kezia Dugdale, Monica Lennon, um, highlighting the problems that we face um, in Europe. And I won't rehearse that. But 80% of refugees are in neighbouring countries, Jeremy Balfour, I don't know if you know that. And in Lebanon, it's one in four. Uh, and I was there in 2016, and that was confirmed by politicians there. We need a global response to this. The Refugee Council points out that some of the poorest children that live in our country are children, uh, refugee and asylum seeking children. With an advocacy service of only £50,000 a year, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary in her summing up would address what more could be done um, to ensure that we have uh, additional resources. I have a special plea on the issue of Dungaval, also mentioned by Christina McKelvey, and I do agree with her that there should be a time limit on detention. But I believe that MSPs, elected members, should have the right to make an annual visit to Dungaval to see whether the conditions that they live in are to our satisfaction. I know their support for this. I call on David Mundell, who I've been writing to for the past year, to back us in this. I finish with the question of um, one of the ways in which refugees can feel more involved in any country, 45 countries have already given uh, refugees the right to vote, mainly in local elections. But it is one way that refugees can feel much more involved, given that they haven't been able to be involved in the democracy of which the country of which they left, because very often they fled because of violence or persecution. Refugees are welcome here. We must be leaders in that. We have a good start with the strategy. I wholeheartedly support it and I'm pleased to contribute to this debate. I call Jamie Green. Uh, up to seven minutes, please, Mr Green. Uh, thank you, Deputy Representative Officer. And can I welcome this debate? I think it's right that the Parliament uses its time in this way uh, to celebrate the immense contributions that refugees have made to our country, but also, as many have done today, actually acknowledge that there is quite a substantial problem out there in the world. One source estimated that there are nearly 70 million people across the world who are either displaced, refugees, uh, or uh, seeking asylum. And it's a grim picture in every part of the world, from Myanmar to Somalia. But within such worldwide misery, pain, and, and turbulence uh, politically, uh, we also find days like World Refugee Day, which is I think uh, quite rightfully aimed at governments and parliaments like ours uh, to widen awareness of the sheer scale of this problem. We've heard many anecdotes today of some specific examples in various countries and some of the, the horror stories that uh, people have shared, indeed some of the casework that some members are, are working on related to people coming from these, these places. Um, here in Scotland, we, and indeed across the UK, we have provided support to refugees through a whole bunch of systems and schemes such as rehousing, uh, integration schemes, language, schooling and education. Uh, our motion acknowledges actually that the Scottish Government did complete its refugee housing target nearly three years early and I think that's something to be uh, warmly welcomed and, and actually congratulated on and, and also to congratulate the local authorities that helped deliver much of that in notwithstanding uh, that many of the housing shortages that exist in different parts of Scotland. Um, I'd also like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for detailing some of the good work that her government is doing on this. There are important points that have been made today in how people do integrate once they arrive into Scotland. Uh, many coming from Iran or Syria or Iraq uh, were doctors and dentists. And uh, yes, we spend a lot of time in this chamber uh, complaining about the lack of such skills. And surely uh, getting these people uh, back into their careers, the careers that they had in their normal environment, may help 
uh, them regain some sort of normality and reality as they start a new life here in our country. Uh, Oliver Mundell summed it up. We are happy to celebrate the successes of the system here in Scotland. We don't have any political points to make in that respect. And I do appreciate there are members here who want to make political points and have made them valiantly. Uh, that's fine. Uh, but it is a fact, and it is a fact that the UK is the world's second largest donor of bilateral aid in the world through choice. Now, I know members are perhaps reluctant to hear that. Uh, facts are often overlooked in the emotion of these subjects and the emotions in the individual cases and indeed sometimes the individual failures of the system. But I think it is right that Scotland and that the UK spend substantial amounts of money of its GDP on international aid. The UK is among just six countries to meet the 0.7% GTB GDP UN aid spending target, not France, not Spain. Excuse me, not Mr. Italy. Green. Could the private conversations at the back of the chamber be quieter, please? Excuse me. Could the private conversations at the back of the chamber be quieter? Thank you. Jamie Green. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, again, I, I restate, I know some members don't want to hear these facts, but they are correct. Um, it's the people on the ground that this money matters to who are thankful. Uh, they are just figures on briefing papers, but every penny of this goes directly to an important cause. Oxfam recently said, those who are critical of UK aid spending should remember the incredible impact that it has around the world, such as supporting 11 million children through school over the five years in one second. Britain, this is Oxfam's words, not mine, Britain is helping to lead the way in global aid spending by hitting the UN spending development target. Save the Children said, we should be proud that Britain stands up for the world's people. And our, age bud our aid budget helps save lives and expand opportunities. I'm happy to give way. Christina for taking the intervention, uh, um, President Officer, thank you. Um, Jamie Green was on the Equality and Human Rights Committee uh, for a long time. We did the inquiry into destitution, um, asylum and insecure immigration status. And he heard many of the facts of the impact of the UK's asylum policies. Does he think, it, think it's fair that the Scottish Government, local authorities and the charity sector in Scotland have to pick up the pieces of that policy? And does he uh, agree with me that £37.75 a week is not enough for anyone to live on, never mind an asylum seeker. Jamie Green. Uh, for the record, uh, the Vice Officer, I was not in the committee when you, you took that evidence and did that report. I wasn't privy to the rating of the report, although I acknowledge its contents. And actually, to uh, respond to the point, um, ha, ha, as Oliver, Oliver Mundell said, has the system uh, got it right all the time? No, absolutely not. That's why we have these debates. It's why people can make their political points as they wish. And yes, should the Home Office be listening to debates such as this? Absolutely they should. Uh, that's why we're here today uh, in government time having this debate. And, and on the point of who picks up the pieces, uh, I think Monica Lennon and indeed others said that it is indeed local authorities who are doing much of the day-to-day -day work. They're at the, the cold face front line of delivering many of these services. They themselves are under huge financial pressures, uh, uh, making budgetary decisions uh, about provisions of services when there are difficulties with housing stocks, difficulties with getting people registered uh, uh, with GPs, getting uh, the children of, uh, uh, of refugees or asylum seekers a place in school. It takes people from different political backgrounds, from local councils, the third sector, the charitable sector, and even uh, community volunteers to make the system work. So in that respect, uh, Mr. Kelvey, I do agree. Um, I think there's a lot to be positive, actually, about how Scotland contributes to supporting refugees from right across the world. And it's easy to miss the bigger picture about how welcoming we have been over the generations. And I've got many examples of that. But that was uh, then, and today is a very different picture. Fulton McGregor said in his statement that this is a global issue. And the Cabinet Secretary herself said that there is also a global responsibility. She is right, but things are far from perfect on the continent. We really talk about the grim reality of what a Euro European-wide problem this is. It was a boat that just a, f a few days ago it was refused entry to Italy, refused entry to Malta, and it took another member state to step in uh, uh, in that area. The Schengen, Schengen area is a, uh, a shadow of its former self in that respect of allowing uh, safe passage for those uh, refugees. Look, including, uh, uh, starting officer, all of this costs money. These aren't just headline figures. This is real cash 
paying for real help. These programs and these schemes cost money, and it is the people that implement these schemes that deserve some respect uh, for the work they do. That is what our amendment sought to recognise, those efforts. And I think it's a shame that others weren't able to join us in the recognition of that good work. And no amount of political, no amount of political point scoring in this chamber will address or tackle any of the complex and deep-rooted causes of international refugee problems. And perhaps the next time we have a debate in this chamber about that, we ought to bear that in mind. Call Angela Constance to wind up on this debate. Nine minutes will take us to decision time. Please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, President Officer. This has been a good debate. It's been feisty in parts, uh, and uh, rightly so. We've heard excellent contributions from Christina McKelvey, uh, Ross Greer, and Alex Cole Hamilton, amongst many others, as well as the outright condemnation of the detention of children uh, with or without their parents. I want to make a quote from Gonzalez Vargas Yusa, who's the UNHCR representative to the UK. Uh, when he was speaking at the launch of the New Scots strategy on the 10th of January this year, and he said, in my 26 years in UNHCR, I have worked with many refugee hosting countries and have rarely seen such a professional and comprehensive piece of work. And I believe that the New Scots strategy could be used as an example and a model, not just UK-wide, but in many countries around the world which host refugees. You should be proud of what you have achieved. Now, I quote uh, that passage in chamber today, presiding officer, not for one minute to pat ourselves on the back. Uh, I think Kezia Dugdale and Alex Cole Hamilton uh, rightly said we have to be uh, guard against being too self-congratulatory uh, or in any way uh, complacent. But I make that quote to actually pay tribute and congratulate, as other members have done, uh, the many uh, voluntary organisations, the many charities, the many faith organisations and all of our local authorities, as well as the Scottish Refugee Council, who are all at the front line, day in, day out, doing what they can to support refugees and asylum seekers who've come to Scotland. And also, like Michelle Ballantyne, I would indeed pay tribute uh, to the Arms Forces uh, and the role uh, in humanitarian work that they play as well. But the facts of the matter are that the scale of the challenge uh, is beyond anything that we have seen historically. The UNHCR submitted over 75,000 refugees for resettlement in 2017, and that was to, to all states worldwide. But that 75,000 was a 54% reduction from 2016 due to the decline in resettlement places. So yes, we need to be helping other countries deal with the challenges that they face within their own borders. But we should not for a minute avoid our responsibilities in stepping up to the plate here and now and saying loudly and clearly that Scotland welcomes refugees and asylum seekers. I'm very pleased, President Officer, to be able to support the, the Green Amendment. We do indeed believe that uh, people who have been welcomed here as uh, refugees or asylum seekers uh, should have the right uh, to vote an election. Uh, I met a young man yesterday who reminded me that he raised this issue with me two years ago, so he is absolutely uh, thrilled. Excuse uh, me, Cabinet Secretary. Could we stop private conversations at the back of the chamber, please? It's very rude and very annoying. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. I'd also say to uh, Christina McKelvey and, and Ross Greer that the Scottish Government also supports calls uh, to limit immigration detention to 28 days and actually, in fact, uh, to move towards uh, alternative uh, community-based uh, approaches because actually uh, they are far more effective. Uh, and based on the facts, 62% of people held in Dungaville uh, actually are released uh, back into our community. I'm also pleased to say that we'll be supporting the amendment uh, from the Labour Party today. We agree on the importance of evaluation to ensure that we know uh, what works and uh, what, what doesn't. Um, and we also agree that integration of refugees and asylum seekers and host communities uh, must be uh, adequately resourced. 
I will, of course, uh, point uh, to uh, the, the investment that we make in Scotland, whether it's through the Family Reunion Crisis Fund, uh, whether it's through the Equalities Budget, uh, ESOL, uh, whether it's through legal aid, uh, or indeed the commitment that I have given uh, to develop a destitution strategy. And while I won't be making promises I can't keep, uh, I will always approach this with a can-do uh, approach and will never uh, demure from my responsibilities to look uh, at the art of the possible. And Monica Lennon uh, rightly says that the UK system, uh, immigration and asylum system, that it lacks compassion. I think I would also say, as well as endorsing that, that it lacks resourcing because we have seen uh, what has been possible with the Syrian resettlement refugee programme because it has been funded and well coordinated. And it is high time that our asylum seekers also receive uh, the same support. Because this gets to the heart of the matter when we talk about widening asylum dispersal. It is a great success and celebration that 31 of our 32 local authorities have received resettle refugees via, via the, the Syrian resettlement programme because of how it was coordinated and how it was funded. And that's both uh, in urban Scotland and indeed uh, in rural Scotland as touched upon uh, by Oliver Mundell. And as a government, we support uh, the widening of asylum dispersal uh, in principle. Uh, it has to be voluntary. Uh, Glasgow City Council have done a, a great job over 15 years or so in accommodating and supporting uh, asylum seekers. And we recognise the need to seek new asylum dispersal areas elsewhere too. But we also have to recognise that this is a big commitment for local authorities as the Home Office does not provide funding to support local authorities participating in asylum dispersal. So the Home Office needs to support and fund the integration of asylum seekers as it does with refugees arriving for resettlement in Scotland and elsewhere in the UK. It needs to end the two-tier system and that in itself would help with the issues uh, around dispersal. And for the Scottish Government's part, uh, we will continue to work with COSLA, uh, the Refugee Council, and will always seek for us to really step up to the plate particularly when it comes to unaccompanied children. And others have mentioned uh, the 10,000 per child uh, funding gap as well. I'm actually, my time is running out and I'm trying to answer as many points as, as possible. I will indeed. Um, and in terms of the, the Conservative Party amendment, um, it, you know, at surface level, it may appear uh, factual, but when you scratch beneath the surface, Although 900 unaccompanied children were transferred from Europe to the UK in 2016, this is a very old figure in the Tory party motion, this of course does not tell the whole story because only 480 children had been transferred to the UK under the Dubs Amendment. And I've had that confirmed in correspondence from Caroline Noakes uh, only last Friday. And that is a far, far cry from the commitment uh, to support 3,000 uh, unaccompanied children. And this latest position is despite uh, the work of Lord Dubbs and many organisations who have highlighted the perils and dangers and risks of exploitation uh, faced by children uh, travelling on their own. And I, President Officer, have also met women who have had to leave their 19-year-old children behind who can't be reunited uh, with their parents in Scotland due to restrictions on current UK family uh, reunion uh, policy. Uh, currently, only dependent children uh, under 18 qualify. So, presiding officer, as we approach uh, five o'clock tonight, um, I hope that Chamber uh, will indeed unite around the calls for a more humane uh, asylum system that treats people with dignity and respect at all times and enables them to rebuild their lives and fulfil their potential. And Jamie Green and Oliver Mundell uh, said uh, that uh, they were sure uh, that the Home Office would be listening. Well, I hope the Home Office are indeed listening and I hope they're listening to our support on calls to end the two-tier uh, asylum process. I hope they will support Angus McNeil's uh, refugee family reunion bill. I hope they'll end the hostile environment. I hope they'll fund uh, integration from day one. And I really hope uh, they'll revisit uh, their disgraceful U-turn uh, on uh, the Dubs Amendment. Because, presiding officer, no one chooses to be a refugee, to flee, leaving behind everything that you've built up over a lifetime, a home, work, school, 
or university, but most heartbreakingly of all, family and friends. And it takes courage and perseverance beyond anything that most of us can imagine to leave everything behind and to start again for no from nothing. And that's why the Scottish Government is committed to supporting refugees and people seeking asylum as they rebuild their lives. It is a moral responsibility, but it's always, always uh, an enormous privilege. And I am happy to consider, in the direct point to Pauline McNeill, uh, to consider what more uh, we can do to help people who are only trying, at the end of the day, to, to find what, what we all want and need. And that's a safe place to call home. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on World Refugee Day. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 12932 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a revised business programme for Wednesday the 27th of June. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to say so now, and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Formally moved. Thank you very much. No member has asked to speak against the motion, therefore the question is that motion 12932 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. We turn now to decision time. The first question is that Amendment 12891.2 in the name of Michelle Ballantyne, which seeks to amend Motion 12891 in the name of Angela Constance on World Refugee Day, supporting people to settle in Scotland, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Not agreed. Right, we'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12891.2 in the name of Michelle Ballantyne is yes, 20, no, 81. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 12891.3 in the name of Monica Lennon, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Angela Constance, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is the amendment 12891.1 in the name of Ross Greer, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Angela Constance be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12891.1 in the name of Ross Greer is yes, 81, no, 20, sorry, no, zero. There were 20 abstentions. The amendment is, the amendment is therefore agreed. And the final question is that motion 12891 in the name of Angela Constance as amended on World Refugee Day be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time and I close this meeting. <laughs>